Kozor Descent into Madness features 43 full color pages of intricately detailed art that tells a nightmare fueled story of foul demons, abundant bloodshed, and the insidious corruption of a warrior's psyche. The story centers around a mighty warrior named Chief Baron and his clan of savage swordsmen who embark on a quest into the sacred swamplands of Nimla in search for the mysterious faceless people, a race of submissive super soldiers who will balance out the odds in a ruthless war between man and demon. But when they're attacked by a flock of flying beasts, their journey proves more fatal than they could have ever imagined. In this campaign, backers get no less than the definitive edition of Kozor Descent into Madness, which comes complete with refined edits, additional story pages, retouched interior artwork, and new wraparound covers. If you're a fan of dark fantasy and medieval horror, this book is for you. Back Kozor Descent into Madness today, only on Indiegogo. Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and welcome to today's comic art tutorial. In this video, we are going to be continuing on with the Kozor Descent Into Madness cover. Now, this is a comic book project that me and my brother Corey have just launched on Indiegogo. We got a link to it in the description below if you'd like to check it out. But let's take a look here at where we're at with the progress on this cover. Now, it's actually a new cover that I did up especially, especially for our very first printing of Kozor. It's very, very exciting. You'll notice that it's a wraparound cover, which means we're going to have splendid looking artwork on the front as well as the back. <clears throat> and I'm about halfway done with the refined pencils. Now I say refined pencils because we're really working over the top of a pre-made sketch, something I prepared a little earlier, that allowed me to establish the general composition for the scene that we're looking at here, where all the characters were going to be placed, what kind of elements were going to be floating around in the background to fill it out, and... Now, at this point, we're ready to move on. We're ready to up-res all of that roughly drawn information and sharpen up the details. However, you will notice, if you're observant, that this isn't by any means polished line art. No, we're going to be leaving that for the inking stage because I really don't want to have to put all this time into making sure that the pencils look polished, only to then have to go ahead with the inks and do that all over again, right? That's just doubling up on the amount of time that is really needed when it comes to putting this cover together and bringing it through to a finish. So I've learned in my experience over the years I've been drawing comic book art that it's far better to keep things probably even looser than this, if I'm being honest with you. Really, I should have stopped at the rough draft jump straight onto the inks from there and moved onward. But, you know, sometimes I get a little bit insecure. I get worried that maybe while I'm inking, I won't really know where to place the cross hatches for the rendering or where to establish the shadows. So I like to plan things out a little bit, but if I plan them out too much, then I start freaking myself out on the inking stage. You know, I'm trying to be more precise with the inks, making sure that I'm tracing exactly over the top of the penciled line work that I've laid down. And I know that's kind of what you're supposed to do, but I find that it kind of takes away some of the soul, some of the creative spirit that I'd otherwise be able to capture in that end rendition of the line art. Because it really is the inks that will be present in the final presentation. And so I want to make sure that 
first and foremost, they have the most character. They've got the most energy. And I feel like a little bit of that is lost if you're uh, you know, you're retracing your steps to the T, going over the top of really refined, slick-looking penciled line art. You know, it doesn't leave any room for creativity when it comes to the inks. And heck, maybe having too much room when it comes to inking is a bad thing. I have no idea, but I've personally found is I have a lot more fun as the artist when I'm able to leave a little bit more up to the imagination during that inking phase. It requires confidence, though. You have to have faith in yourself that even though you haven't exactly got things nailed down just yet during the penciling stage, that it'll all work out fine during the inks, through the process of laying down those finely inked, polished contours and rendering everything out until it's done. Now you can see here, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to create a smooth, interesting looking transition between the art on the front cover and the artwork featured on the back cover. And so you can see that by the way, you're looking at Chief Baron here. Both of these characters are Chief Baron. The dude in the front there with the big axe hanging over his shoulder and then the big headshot that we see on the back. It's just that the difference here on the back is that we've taken off his mask and so you can actually see what his face looks like underneath the, uh, the, the essentially the leather face masks that he's created. For those who don't yet know, that mask that he is donning was actually a foe that he came up against and a victim of his giant axe who apparently had the skin ripped off their head and is now being worn by Chief Baron as some kind of sick trophy. This guy is an absolute savage. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you take Conan and just make him a whole lot more badass and evil looking, a whole lot more savage and ruthless, then you get Chief Baron, right? So I'm trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to make this transition work? And, you know, having that weird, spiky, sharp, toothy texture unleashing from the back of the headshot and into the front cover in the background there with the main figure is it looks a little bit too weird to me it's supposed to be like demonic teeth like a big mouth that you're looking into except it kind of looks like porcupine hair to me and so uh, later on spoiler alert i actually take all of that out and just place in a whole bunch of rendering instead so that i can gradually transition it from this kind of ambiguous foggy sky and into his head with the colouring. And uh, that's exactly what I will end up doing later on. But uh, it takes me a little while sometimes to get to the right point I need to be at in order to make the decisions I've got to make. And you can see here that I'm doing some more experimenting. I'm exploring my options. I'll tell you that, I'm an explorer of ideas when it comes to this stuff. And I'm not going to lie, I had a lot of fun exploring those ideas. I don't know what's going to work half the time. All I know is that I've got to give it a shot, see how it looks on the page, whether or not it's going to stick. And if it doesn't, I'll just get the eraser out. It's no big deal. I'll just get the eraser out and I'll start again. It's, uh, you know, it's all part of the creative process. The important thing to remember is knowing when to experiment within that process. Because here's the thing, we're still in the beginning stages here, right? Like, it, it's not as if if we do make a mistake and we pull out that eraser that we're going to be erasing hours upon hours of extremely polished line work. You know, this is, we're still pretty sketchy here. And so there is a little bit of room to move. And you can see I'm doing my darndest here to just merge everything into one cohesive element, the front and the back trying to tie it together, but it's just it's just not working out for me. So, you know, a little bit of time wasted, but hey, it's always worth it in the end in order to reach the conclusion that will ultimately be present within the, the final 
uh, artwork that we're going to end up with here. So I'm just throwing in some shadows. I'm pretty sure that in order to come up with this idea, I was actually looking at some reference material, covers by other artists that I admire, such as Mark Silvestri and David Finch. And I was looking at you know, how do they make these backgrounds work sometimes? How do they fill everything out? And so I just, I, I ripped them off. I ripped them off all the time. You know, art is stealing at the end of the day. You just got to know how to steal it in a way that, uh, you know, is new and inventive. And you're able to give it your own spin in a sense. Of course, you never want to take anything at face value. You just, I think that the thing is, when it comes to your artistic inspirations, your favorite comic art influences, you, you know, they're going to compel you to create something similar to, to the very thing that they're putting out there that's inspiring you. And so I don't think there's any shame in letting them direct the flow of your ideas and how they may or may not end up on the page in that final presentation. I mean, it all depends really at the end of the day on how you absorb what you are seeing from them, interpret it, and then do something else interesting with it. Our brain is very good at free association. In other words, what I mean by that, and we do do this all the time, is that when you see a cool comic book or you see a movie or you hear a piece of music, ideas start forming within your mind. And it's these ideas that you really want to capture. They're kind of related to the thing that you're experiencing, that you're taking in, but they're a little bit different, right? Like they're, they're setting off new and interesting ideas inside your own mind. And so that's how our ideas are able to be directed. And look, I've said this before, but when it comes to completely new ideas as opposed to ideas that are derived from something else, you know, you hear about derivative work and everybody says that when something's derivative that it's a bad thing. Well, is it really? I don't know. I don't think so, to be honest with you, because when I see a piece of derivative work that falls within the realm of sci-fi or fantasy, uh, then you know, which are genres that are very appealing to me. Uh, a horror, if I see a character that looks similar to another character that I really love, then I'm going to be like, hey, you know, this dude looks like Spawn. I've never seen him before. <laughs> I've uh, I've never read a comic book of this, this new and interesting character before, but he looks kind of like Spawn, so I'm probably going to like him, right? And again, you know, Spawn's one of my favorite characters created by the wonderful Todd McFarlane, who is in and of himself a great artistic influence on me and the direction that I've taken my style in. But you get the idea. Completely new is, is kind of hard to relate to for newcomers. You know, if, if they can't make already existing connections between what they know and the new thing that you're showing them, there's every chance in the world that they're simply going to be disinterested. It won't capture their attention. You know, there's a difference between coming across something new, which oftentimes we actually don't pay attention to new things because it's just not within our scope of uh, understanding or experience. And so the other alternative of that is when we see something that's new that we can somehow recognize all of a sudden we're like, great, you know, that grabs our attention straight away because it, it looks like something that we already know about. And I hope that my point is coming across here. You know, a lot of the time when I release a new character design, for example, almost immediately somebody is going to jump into the comments section on social media and they're going to compare it and contrast it to characters that are already out there. One of the latest characters that I came up with for my own comic book project, Renegade Alpha, there was a, uh, a lovely lady character called Ricochet that I created, and she looked a lot like Kemi. I mean, to some people, really, the only thing that made her look like Kemi from Street Fighter was the beret that she was wearing and the minimalistic amount of outfit that she had on. But that's all it took for people to cr create that association with her. And hey, I look at Kemi from Street Fighter as an amazingly successful 
being part of an amazingly successful IP. You know, people really love that character. So if there's some similarities between that character and the one I'm putting out, I feel like, hey, Clayton, you're on track here. You're doing something that very likely other people are going to dig. So, you know, I think that it's kind of a, it's a good sign when your characters are compared to other characters. You know, I know that we all want to be original and unique in what we put out there for other people to experience, but uh, that's just all to do with the ego, you know? We want to be the, the new and and sexy of, of whatever we're putting out. We want to be originals. Uh, we want to feel like we invented something that nobody else has seen before, and that feels really, really great because we, we get these special feelings of importance uh, when that happens. But uh, you know what? The thing is, is that, that that actually really happens. You know, anything that's popular out there, I can guarantee you, was based on things that were already popular, and the new version of it, the, the derivative version of it, I guess you could call it, has just simply had some kind of spin put on it, uh, that it's been... Maybe it was something old that was successful once upon a time that just got new life breathed into it, right? You see that a lot of the time in, in indie comics now that a lot of the old superheroes from the Golden Age, the uh, the Bronze Age and what have you, I'm not exactly sure of the timelines here, but I believe some of them are being you know, put into the public domain, which means anybody can access them. Take The Wizard of Oz, for example. Uh, there's a lot of people creating comic books and movies surrounding that particular IP. And, uh, you know, a guy called Eric Weathers, in fact, he, he's got a comic book coming out called Battle Brick Road, which puts a whole new spin on The Wizard of Oz. And it's, it's breathing new life into this story that everybody knows and loves, but is now being presented in a new and interesting way. Right? So now it's all of a sudden something old has become fresh and we know it and we love it. And now it's even better because we get the next installment of it in a whole different form. It's not the same as it was before. You know, if we went into it expecting that it was going to be the same, we'd probably be disappointed. So, you know, it's this weird middle point. There's a weird middle ground where we're getting something that we know, but it's also new and unique. And I just think that that's one of the best balances that you can strike when it comes to putting a new idea out there in a comic book, in a movie, in, in whatever it is. Because one of the things that sell a product extremely successfully is that sense of nostalgia that we're all hooked into, right? And, you know, ask anybody, anybody born in the 80s, right? They'll want the 80s to come back. And they'll always tell you, there are things that were invented in the 80s. Now, that was the time. They, those were the days. That's when we actually had good music and good movies. You know, the stuff that you're watching these days is just, you know, it's crap in comparison. Or the 90s, when I was born and, and when I was raised. You know, all the, comics book back, all the comic books back then, from Image that those incredible artists were putting out, and creators, Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, Jim Lee, you know, they all left Marvel and didn't go over to DC. Instead, they started their own comic book company and publisher. And then they went in and kind of split off into their own little sub-companies, sub-studios. But they put out some amazing books, beautiful books that, you know what? You know, I sound like an old man now because I can honestly tell you that I haven't seen comic books that capture my attention, capture my heart, capture the energy of the 90s for an extremely long time, right? So nostalgia sells really, really well. Like if you give me a comic book that looks like it was from the 90s with characters that look like they were invented in the 90s, even if they're similar, right? And back then they actually did have a lot of new characters that were coming out, like Rob Liefeld, for example, he was putting out characters that look remarkably similar to pre-existing characters, such as Wolverine, right? I forget exactly what that character was called, but again, looked so much like Wolverine. And then, you know, you think about Todd McFarlane's characters, you know, Spawn, for example. Um, Spawn was, was a pretty 
unique character, I think, but there were definitely similarities there. It was just those similarities had now a different take on them, which made that character much more compelling, yet still relatable. So it's a good thing to try and draw from your inspirations. Just put them in a bit of a blender and see what comes out. See what you can work with after that. You know, a lot of the times, a single image of a character, like the one that you're looking at me draw up here, it can inspire an entire narrative within your mind, even though you know nothing about it. And I feel like when we see pre-existing content out there, that's exactly what we do. You know, we take the elements that we like and we reuse it. We recycle them. And we've done that for an extremely long time, since the since the dawn of man, you know, we've been recycling things. Uh, I mean, heck, if you look at all the religions throughout the world, right, so many of them have so much in common, uh, but they're all different in their own way as well, you know. Uh, not, again, the religion or anything like that, but it's, it's, it's an interesting observation to make. I think we need that, too. You know, it's kind of the way our brains work. I think that even if you were to give the world something pure and something that had never, ever been seen or experienced by anybody before, a newcomer would take a look at that and they would still, just because of the way in which the brain works, create associations that were familiar to them and connect them to that new thing that you're showing them so that they could understand it and interpret it in in a way that was digestible. You know, there's a uh, there's a phenomenon that I heard of once where, um, you know, if someone does see something completely new, they actually won't be able to take it in. They won't be able to process it. Uh, you know, they won't be able to understand exactly what it is they're seeing if they're able to see it at all. And... One of the reasons as to why that comes about is is simply because um, we, we've got this matrix inside our mind of things that we understand and we filter the rest of the world through that matrix. It's, it's really an incredible and fascinating thing. And even though we're getting a little bit off track here <laughs> with Clayton's philosophizationing, um, this is the kind of stuff I think about while I'm drawing, funnily enough. A lot of the time, I let my mind wander, and I think that that's a good exercise to do when it comes to drawing. I think it's a wonderful thing, you know. That's what being a creative person is all about: putting pencil to paper and just letting your imagination fold out across the landscape of, of potential things that you could draw, that you could potentially present to the rest of the world. When you let your mind wander like that, and I don't know if we get a lot of opportunity to do it that much these days because we have so many distractions. Social media is always pulling our attention aside and saying, hey, you know, someone just gave you a new like. Someone's just messaged you and you've got a ton of things in your inbox. It's, it's so attention grabbing. It, it takes so much time away from that space that you would always otherwise have had, you know, before all of this stuff started coming along, now I do really sound like an old man, where you could just sit down and and ponder. Be bored. You know what happens when you get bored? Your imagination starts going crazy, right? It, all of a sudden, you, you're coming up with ideas that you would have never have thought of before because your mind is able to to rest and and remain idle for a little bit. The other thing is, is all these distractions are extremely exhausting. So by the time you finally do unhook from it all, all you want to do is pass out. You just want to sleep, maybe tune into a mind, uh, a mind-numbing activity of some kind, such as watching a movie or playing a video game. Right? Again, another distraction that doesn't really allow you that the freedom to be able to imagine an exciting and new character or story for that that comic book that you might someday create and even if you are working on a comic book currently you know it's still a really great idea 
If you want to come up with new potential directions within the narrative that you could go in to take a moment, take some time out to thinkitate, right? Thinkitation, it's like meditation, except you're, you're thinking about stuff and, and letting your mind wander a little bit, letting it off the leash. I think it's an important activity that has been somewhat lost in the modern age, unfortunately. And I'm trying to get back to that because I see the effects that it has on me personally. I used to be able to sit down and draw for no joke hours on end without being distracted. I'd just sit there, I'd be drawing away and the hours would go by I wouldn't even notice what was happening around me. I would be completely submerged in what we like to call the zone. But I got to tell you that all my focus muscles have become extremely limp over the last decade. Yeah, I'm serious. I can barely sit down for an hour before getting the itch to do something else and move around and check my social media, check my phone find a way to quench the addiction of that next dopamine hit that my brain is after. And I feel like so many of us are hooked on that. Me, again, me included. I want to kick, I want to kick that addiction so hard because I know that I'd get a ton more done. And slowly but surely, like any other muscles throughout the human body, the brain is an organ, but it's also kind of a muscle. I've been slowly trying to extend my periods of focus once more so that I can build up my concentration and allow it to be able to be fixated on something for a longer period of time. I'm trying to get used to the act of doing that again. And it is paying off a little bit every time I sit down to do something and and I really do intend to not get up and just keep going until I, I can't anymore, until my hand drops off, which, you know, as I've gotten older is another issue that has cropped up. I kind of, I'm forced to take breaks as well now, just out of, you know, physical exhaustion within my hand. I certainly don't want to ever contract that horrible condition known as tendonitis, although I do fear that it's going to happen. It's going to happen at some point. I'm going to have to put down the pencil, and I'll only be able to draw for like five minutes before my hand starts throbbing. So I put in measures to try to avoid that on top of it. And for those of you who also have started to feel the repercussions of extended drawing sessions in your own hands, I've realized that for me, I've got to loosen that grip around my stylus because I've got like this death grip (laughs) that I, uh, for some reason or another, I I think it's probably the tiny little details. You can see the rendering I'm adding in here on this, this girl that's, that's kneeling down on the ground, holding the, uh, the, the, the cross there. It's not really a crucifix. It's more like some kind of weird, uh, crucifix shaped three headed bird. It's religious in nature. Corey has this, uh, this three headed God figure within, uh, the story of Kozor. Again, Corey wrote and illustrated the original version of Kozor. For this particular release, however, I am going back over all of the interior art, rejigging the line art where necessary, popping those colors out and harmonizing them, just to make sure that everybody who backs this book is going to get the very definitive edition of it when they eventually receive it in the mail. But anyway, back to what I was saying. You can see all those little tiny details that I'm adding into her dress, really trying to describe the forms of the folds within uh, within her dress there. And after hours of doing that, I don't know if it just took me hours. I hope it didn't take me hours. I hope it only took me maybe half an hour. But after doing that for an extended period of time, regardless my hand is just, it's tired. It's had enough. It's saying, Clayton, you got to take a break. And sometimes I'll forget to take a break and 
I'll pay for that. I really will. I won't be able to, you know, draw for the rest of the day. And I do know that the danger of having that happen all too often is permanent damage. Where, you know, you I don't know if you've ever seen the seen the images on Google, if you've ever ventured into this portion of the internet, but uh, I got to tell you, looking at those operations that some people got to get on their wrists in order to rectify that tendonitis is not pretty. It scares the hell out of me, if I'm being honest with you. So, again, I want to avoid that at all costs. Heck, I want to avoid any operations at all. So, the thing is, is that during this current time, that we're all kind of stuck in with with what's going on in the world. Exercise, physical healthiness is not exactly something that many of us have been able to preserve just because, you know, it's not as easy to get to the gym. I mean, for some people, they can't get to the gym at all. Like right now, we're stuck inside, confined to our homes. So unless we can somehow conjure up the motivation to do a home workout each and every day, a lot of our fitness has just kind of slipped away. All I have been doing, to be honest with you, is drawing. That's about it. So my wrist is getting a good workout. Um, but uh, but nothing else really, you know. The only time I actually get up from my desk to walk around is to make a coffee. So this really isn't a healthy lifestyle that I have created for myself as of recently. And it's something that, you know, you got to look at the areas within your life. And this can be applied to your artwork as well. I mean, it can be applied to anything. you got to be looking and the areas that aren't quite working, that aren't quite as optimized as they could be, and you got to work on them, right? It's not about looking for what's going right all the time, even though we enjoy doing that because it feels good. Again, we get that little dopamine hit inside our brain, and it makes us feel all giddy and warm and fuzzy inside. No, instead, we want to be disappointing ourselves a little bit more in order to make actual progress. We want to be looking for the faults within what we're doing. And just to relate this back to art, this is the only way in which I was able to improve upon the weaknesses that were present at any one point in my artistic development. I had to look for when my character's were drawn with odd-looking proportions, or when the anatomy was all out of whack, or when a design looked cruddy. And I had to make sure that I addressed it in the best way possible and took a special note of when things weren't working out in a particular way so that I could avoid it next time. You know, a lot of us are afraid to look in the mirror in that way, and it's you know, it's not a good thing. You've, you've got to make sure that you're able to be brave enough, brave enough to see things for what they are and to be really honest with where you're at. Now, again, back to my fitness, uh, I got to, you know, I've, I've kept my shape a little bit, but I'm nowhere near as buff as I'd like to be. I feel like I've, I've lost a little bit of muscle mass. So if I want to fix that, and I want to be able to remain strong and, and healthy, as healthy as I was at the start of this year, then i got to get back on top of that stuff. i got to be hard on myself. You know, I'm not going to feel like doing any physical exercise. I never do. I Honestly, when I was going to the gym, I hated the gym. But I would push myself, and I made it a habit, right? When it comes to my drawings, I don't want to have to erase something and do it all over again. I don't want to have to throw something out only to have to redraw it. That sucks. Like before, for example, when I was kind of erasing and redrawing that background blend between the front and back cover here. You know, but you got to, right? It's... It's not just an exploration of your ideas and, and what you could the directions you could pen, potentially go in with them, but it's also a an experimentation, an exploration in order to find what the best route that you could possibly take is. 
so that you can stick with it and turn it into a process, a process can, that can be reenacted time and time again in order to get to the place that you want to be at much faster. So, I mean, that's just my opinion on the matter and something that I, I think about often. Again, there's a lot of time to think when you're drawing. So you can see here that I'm, I'm knocking out more of that rendering into her dress and I'm pulling out the eraser when I think that I haven't rendered it just quite right. And it's all about trying to get those forms looking accurate. However, this is a bit more of a stylized visual, I would say. I don't know if dresses really kind of fold up in that way and, and have that many wrinkles, but I did... I will tell you that I did have some references up to make sure that I was getting it moderately correct. There's not a whole lot of references to pick from when you Google girl in dress kneeling down, unfortunately. At least not a lot of references that were featuring women, featuring women in dresses that mimicked the style that I'm trying to represent here for this character. So we're doing the shoulder section of Chief Baron now. He's got this big cape that wraps around it, and I'm just trying to get the folds looking right on it. This is going to be a combination of things, of course. It'll be some contours here and there, a little bit of rendering, but also a lot of big shadows. And in order to get them placed right, i got to make sure that I'm keeping in mind my light source and that it is indeed consistent with the very light source that I've used to light his head. So you can see that it's shining down onto him, lighting him from the side, but more from the back side in, uh, in this particular example. You can see there that the way in which I have shadowed his cheek, it's, it's not shadowed from behind, it's shadowed in the front there, and it's creating this beautiful shape, this really nice contour that helps to define the anatomy of his facial structure. And for me, that's important. I think that especially on a dude, it can add just so much more character. And on a lady character, you kind of want to keep it a little bit bare. You don't want to be adding too many details. That's just going to age a female character, and it'll, it'll make their, uh, their skin appear blemished sometimes so I like to avoid that unless I am drawing an elderly female character then of course you know I'm going to add a few more details in there to make sure that that's coming across visually but really I reserve the details for the dudes because for some reason or another it just works really well I'm pretty sure it's because in reality there's all that testosterone pumping through the veins of men tend to give us more defined features and so because we're drawing comic books here and we're exaggerating all of that visual information that's why i add, take the time to add in those extra that extra rendering those extra shadows to really define the forms the underlying anatomy that we're dealing with here so I'm back to the lady character. Now, this, this girl is actually Chief Baron's daughter, believe it or not. And she does feature within the first issue of Kozor. She features more prominently within the second issue as a main character. But again, no spoilers. I have a habit of giving away too many spoilers. I'm trying to make sure I don't do that. Otherwise, Corey will yell at me. So uh, the good news is, though, is that once Kozor descent into madness, our first issue within the series is being fulfilled in March 2021. It's a little bit of a wait, but we wanted to give ourselves some extra time just to make sure we were able to overcome the obstacles that are inevitably going to pop up when it comes to actually printing the book. We've never done it before. It's new to us. We know how to draw and whatnot. We know how to put this thing together and print it so, and produce it, rather. So we're not too worried about that. When it comes to actually getting it out there and printing the thing, though, we're complete newbies. So we've given ourselves extra time for the, the dilemmas that may pop up during that stage of the publishing process. But uh, our idea is that if we can get it out by March 2021 or earlier, that's our goal, right? Guar that's our guarantee, in fact. So the good news is, is that when we do get it out by then, 
Kozo issue two, we don't quite have a name for uh, the subtitle for it just yet. I'm sure it'll be just as great as Descent into Madness, though, depending on what Corey's able to come up with for it. But by the time this is being fulfilled, issue two will be ready to go. It'll be done. And Corey will, in fact, be on to issue three, which he cannot wait to get started on. So we got a long-term vision for Kozor, a long-term vision for this comic book that we're really, really excited about. You know, <laughs> you don't get artwork like this unless you're excited about what it is you're working on. So it was a real honor to actually draw up this cover for Corey's story. You know, I'd always wanted to draw the characters from Kozor because I think they look really cool and Corey has just designed them so well. Like, I love Chief Baron's outfit. It is totally badass, right? You got this arm that covers his chest and then you got the abs that are bare and exposed, which, you know, looks cool. You've got, you know, just everything about this guy. He's a He's bulky. He's a bear, right? <laughs> well, he could at least fight a bear, I think. He's a, he's a beast of a man. And that's the exact look that I wanted to capture for the character. And when Corey saw the finished product, when he saw this cover, he was absolutely blown away by it, which I could have hoped nothing more than that. You know, I always want to do justice to anyone's characters whom I'm drawing and to know that Corey, of all people, my brother, that he was happy with what I'd done up for him, that uh, that meant the world. So I was very pleased about that. So now you can see me adding in this nice big tree in behind Chief Baron's daughter. Now she does have a name. It escapes my mind at this point in time, but uh, I'll update you. I'll update you when I find out more on that. Anyway, this big tree that I'm placing in behind her, I'm thinking is going to make her pop right off of the page because I want to really render out everything behind her. And I'm hoping that the lighter tones on her hair, the highlights on her dress will really just will give her that additional level of depth that I'm looking for. A lot of the time, what creates that added level of three-dimensionality within an artwork is the way in which you play with the tones, how they dance together, the patterns that they create. This is what allows you to capture an immediate readability within your artwork, which is especially important in a complex piece such as this. There is a lot going on. There's a ton of details, so many elements that you can see present within this wraparound cover. I'm thinking she's going to have a crow sitting on her shoulder. Crows seem to be the the animal spirit of this comic book. I had a few references up for those. I quickly scribbled them down. Nothing too fancy, just really the silhouettes of crows. For the most part, you can't see any of the details. They're just, they're almost pure black. So they're supposed to be kind of fluttering, flying up into the tree there. Eventually, I decide that I'm just going to take them out because it's too much going on. You know, you got to know when to leave things in and when to cut them. Unfortunately, that's just a par for the course, right? Is that, how you, is that how you say that? I don't know. Look at me trying to be all fancy. So we're going in. I'm adding shadows into this tree. I love organic elements such as this because you can have a lot of fun with the details and they don't really need to look like anything in particular. Like, you can still tell that this is a tree, yet at the same time, I can't disclose exactly what tree this is supposed to be, like what species of tree you're looking at here. I don't have a reference for it. I just completely made it up. The key thing that I was looking for with it was a shape that kind of fit in nicely with the rest of the composition. And then I just... I went for it, right? I know that the trunk is going to be a cylinder. I know that the tree uh, branches are going to be cylinders as well that follow this kind of snake-like pattern along their trajectory. 
And so, you know, I've got a pretty good idea as to how they're going to be shaded according to this pre-established lighting condition that I've placed everything else under. So I'm just going to add in the shadows, make them look kind of organic, break them up a bit in order to be able to achieve that. And then here's the really tough part, was adding in these leaves. I was like, how am I going to do these leaves? I don't know. What, what are they supposed to look like? What can I do to them that will actually make them look like leaves? Because here's the thing. like It's easy enough to draw a single leaf, but then when you're looking at a bunch of leaves from a distance, a lot of the like discerning individual leaves isn't really the, something that you can do easily, even in reality. They kind of all blur into one and clump together into bodies of leaves, you know, larger forms full of leaves. And so you've got shadows and rendering that you can use to suggest the individual leaves within those larger forms that they're clumping together to create, but you really don't want to be defining each and every single one of them, especially from this distance. Like if, if you were right up against this tree, like you were climbing on the branch, looking down at the leaves, sure, you could kind of define each and every single one, but you really don't want to be doing that here. Otherwise, it'll look weird. Like you're not supposed to be able to see the individual leaves from this distance. So what I did was I did what I always do when I get a little bit confused and I'm trying to figure out how to represent something in a comic book art medium. And I decided that I'd find some artworks by Mark Silvestri because I had, and also uh, some artworks from Greg Capullo because I remember seeing some spawn covers that he did back in the day that featured some trees. And I also know that I've seen covers by Mark Silvestri that featured old broken down trees with leaves and so I was looking at them, I was looking at what they did, and I basically just, I, once more, I stole from them. I, I took from their techniques. And uh, look, I'm, I'm openly admitting that. I think that everybody should do it. If you're ever stuck, look for examples that are going to help you to get out of those sticky situations, right? And you'll be able to learn a lot from that. You won't ever have to sit down and to try to struggle to draw out a tree again because you would have worked your way past that that stumbling block. So now I'm trying to cast some shadows that are being projected from the leaves onto the branches below and gradually but surely describe the cylindrical form of the tree by and, and also the texture of the bark that that the the tree is coated with by adding in that rendering around the shadows and and again just trying to keep things very tactile looking like I want to make it look as though if you reached out to touch this tree that it would feel bumpy and it would feel like bark we've got this uh, I don't know what you'd call it like a possum hole that I've added in onto the main tree trunk there I'm messing around with it. You know, you look at something like this, it looks so detailed and intimidating, but actually it's probably like the easiest part of the entire illustration that I worked on. It's it's really funny in that way. The things that you think are going to be difficult turn out to be easy, and the things that you think are going to be easy turn out to be the biggest headaches of all, let me tell you. That is always the way it goes for me. So as I add in the rendering, you'll notice that I'm trying to have it either run along or around the form that I'm placing it upon. Now, this is important because you may be describing multiple things at once when it comes to laying in your hatches. You might be describing the forms, which is important, but you also might be describing the texture of that form as well. We call it a surface texture. And I really was able to grasp a lot of this because... You know, back in the day when I was working in the video game industry and studying up on everything that was involved with it, you know, you would talk about very similar topics that you, you know, there's a lot of connections that you can draw between 3D modeling, 3D sculpting and drawing with a pencil and paper, you know, because all of those things, what they have in common is you're still dealing with form, you're still dealing with lighting, you're still dealing with those surface textures. You just kind of 
have to begin to understand those things in a slightly different way, in a slightly different form of application. But it was really cool because I feel like I got this this new paradigm of understanding because I had I had studied in multiple disciplines, if you get what I'm saying. So I find I found that to be really, really valuable. And the funny thing is, is that whenever I would learn something in 3D modeling, it would translate directly over into my drawing. And I mean, from the moment that I started 3D modeling and digital sculpting, everything that I had already pre-known about drawing translated over into it. So I was actually a pretty damn good 3D modeler and digital sculptor right from the get-go. You know, I knew my proportions. I knew my anatomy. So those were things I didn't have to worry about, even though a lot of people who didn't have that background experience in drawing uh, who are jumping over into digital sculptor or 3D modeling, they, they would have really, I think, you know, struggled with those basic fundamentals that really form the basis of a good drawing or a good sculpture. So now I'm adding in grass again. I have no idea how to draw grass. You know, I went into this feeling a little bit uneasy. I was like, how am I going to approach this? I guess... I'll just see what happens. I'll lay down some lines and I'll try to suggest some forms, right? Because as with the tree leaves, grass kind of clumps together as well. All those individual blades of grass that I'm suggesting there actually group together. The eye, in reality, literally groups them together. Like if you're looking at a meadow that's off into the distance... I can guarantee you that you won't be able to see every single blade of grass unless you've got some kind of supersonic vision that allows you to be able to see tiny little details from a, from a, an extended distance. So you want to kind of clump them together. And I'm just I'm thinking about how those blades of grass and the, gr the way in which they're grouped together will be layered upon one another. Okay, so I'm trying to get this this sense of layering happening, and then you can see that these there's these cliffs and these hills within the far backgrounds. So now I've got to try to describe them and suggest detail without actually placing in detail, and you know it's it's all about creating an illusion of depth here. Because the thing is, if I was to pump in the detail on these mountains in the background like i was i was defining every single little rock or tree on that mountain it would lose the depth of of feel that we're creating here right it would appear closer than it actually is instead of being far away so you know the more detailed something is the closer it will appear and the less detailed it is the further back it'll look right these are all tricks of depth that you can utilize to your advantage when it comes to a compelling looking illustration that really does have that 3D-ness about it. And we're always trying to do that within comic book art. Why? Because we want the illustrations to pop out of the panels as you're experiencing that visual narrative. That's when you get an enthralling book and a satisfying experience from your audience because oh well for your audience that's when you create that for them because you know something that just appears flat that has no depth to it no visual interest that's just going to be unsatisfying that's not going to hook anybody in right you want to really make your audience your reader feel as though they're a part of the world, they're a part of the story. You want to really submerge them into this idea that you're representing on the page. And one of the best ways to do that is to use your ability to represent depth, represent different lighting conditions, create a, a mood for which everything that you're drawing can be can be kind of squeezed into, right? It's all got to be cohesive, right? You've got to make sure that every single element within any given composition, it's got to work together. If, if it's not sticking, if it's not holding together, then it will fall apart. So 
You can see here that I'm having a little bit of trouble with the shadows and the rendering that I'm placing onto Chief Baron's cape as it folds over his shoulder and runs down the length of his back there. It's just about getting that flow right. You know, capes, like with hair, they have a certain amount of gesture to them. That, and they're organic, right? The really interesting thing about material, though, in general, is a lot of the time its primary form is determined by the underlying form that it's coating. But then on top of that primary form, you've got a bunch of subforms. Those subforms are the actual dips and rises of the folds and creases within that material. And they're all going to be shaped by that underlying form as well that the material is, uh, is placed over the top of. So that's what makes drawing cloth extremely tricky because because it can be, it's so dynamic really in nature. It's not ever drawn in any one way. It moves with the body. It moves with the environmental conditions that are going on around the character. If you've got a big gust of wind that's just billowing down upon them, or, or it's raining onto that character's clothing and the material is all of a sudden wet, it's going to change in terms of the way that it's represented. So this is, again, something that I'm always thinking about. There's, there's so many things to consider when it comes to accu accurately representing these elements that you're drawing within an artwork. So the other thing that I had realized was, and this is such a big mistake on my part, is I missed a design detail within Chief Baron. So as it turns out, this dude is actually missing an eye, and I drew him with an eye. Luckily, Corey pointed this out to me, much to my disdain, by the way. Like, I thought that the eye that I had given him looked fantastic, and then Corey's like, yeah, dude, it does look great, but, uh, yeah, he doesn't actually have an eye. You know, it's been gouged out. So I was like, damn... I guess I'm going back to this. I guess it's not done. I was looking forward to jumping onto the inks after that point, but I went that extra mile just for him and really for the audience as well. You like you want to make sure that the designs of your characters are consistent within the book, otherwise they're going to be like, what the hell is going on here? So I went back in. I redrew the gouged out eye over the top of the eye that was intact place some blood splatters around it, really try to, you know, push the socket inward to make sure that it, it actually did like look like a gaping hole that was just sitting there. Very, very disgusting, of course. You know, it's it's kind of disturbing to look at this, but you know, Kozor is a disturbing kind of book. It's not for the kids. It's for the adults and, you know, maybe the teenagers who want to get into something a little bit more hardcore. I know when I was a teenager, I loved things like Spawn, right? I wasn't into Spider-Man or Batman or any of that softcore comic book stuff. I wanted the hardcore, uh, you know, dark superheroes like the Darkness and, and Spawn and, as I already mentioned, and uh, The Creech was really great as well. There was a, which was uh, an independent comic book that Greg Capullo had put out through Image and uh, that had some scenes in it that were just brutal, right? People being blown up blood and guts. Loved Judge Dredd as well for that reason. So, you know, Kozor is a bit more within that realm and I gotta tell you, that's the kind of comic books I want to create as well. You know, I don't want my, our comic books, Barton Bros Studios, they're not gonna be uh, for a younger demographic, I don't think. They're definitely going to be awesome. They're going to be more aimed toward adults and, and people who like things like horror and, and sci-fi and horror and medieval fantasy, dark fantasy, I should say. Well, that just about wraps up today's demonstration. I do hope that you got a ton 
of value out of it. And uh, this pretty much wraps up the refined penciling stage for this wraparound cover. Next, we will be jumping onto the inks. There will no doubt be a series of videos covering that process because it was very long and tedious. I don't mind telling you. And then finally, of course, we've got another series of videos after that that will cover the whole coloring phase of the creation of this cover. Again, if you would like to check out the Kozor comic book campaign on Indiegogo, we have a link to that in the description below. I'll leave, a, uh, uh, I'll leave the trailer run at the end of this video again, just so that you can uh, get a taste for what's in store with the book. But before we do that, I do have to remind you that if you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. Over on the site, you'll find a bunch of written tutorials, video tutorials, a podcast, and when you're ready to take your comic art skill set to the next level, I highly suggest that you check out the How to Draw Comics store. We've got a bunch of courses on there from a range of specialized instructors who will teach you everything you need to know about anatomy, perspective, proportions, character design, etc, etc. Everything you could ever want to know about. All right, so that's it. Enjoy the Kozor trailer. And again, if you like what you see, click the link in the description below and check out the campaign. All right, that's it. Until next time, keep on drawing, keep on creating, and I'll catch you in the next video. Kozor Descent into Madness features 43 full-color pages of intricately detailed art that tells a nightmare-fueled story of foul demons, abundant bloodshed, and the insidious corruption of a warrior's psyche. The story centers around a mighty warrior named Chief Baron and his clan of savage swordsmen who embark on a quest into the sacred swamplands of Nimla in search for the mysterious faceless people, a race of submissive super soldiers who will balance out the earth in a ruthless war between man and demon, but when they're attacked by a flock of flying beasts, their journey proves more fatal than they could have ever imagined. In this campaign, backers get no less than the definitive edition of Kozor Descent into Madness, which comes complete with refined edits, additional story pages, retouched interior artwork, and new wraparound covers. If you're a fan of dark fantasy and medieval horror, this book is for you. Back Kozor Descent into Madness today, only on Indiegogo.